So thank you very much for joining in on this call <coughs> uh, this early after lunch. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit on how we at BMW IT actually use what you guys are doing. So how we use configuration management in a quite big environment. Let me introduce myself. My name is Janusz Maciaszowski. I'm a, a Linux um, architect at the moment. I work at uh, Munich at the Central IT. And I have some background in IT operations where I did first and second level IT support for the same systems I'm currently now helping design them. Um, uh, this is not going to be about cars, so even BMW and cars, this is going to be about IT, so sorry. <laughs> um, first half will be about understanding how IT in a big environment, big corporation works. So I'm going to talk about processes, uh, standards and also how this IT actually fits in all of these. And the second part is what our requirements were, how we manage our systems, where we come from, where we are going to, how we designed the whole system we are currently using, how we approached risks and how we try to mitigate them. So, first is an overview of how our IT works. So, base level data centers, it's operated by an internal team of us and uh, we are basically building up on top of that, there is a network team, there is a storage team, you know, the silo approach. Everybody has, everyone has his expertise and everybody is doing what he or she is the best in. Then there is the, the classical compute IT that basically provides um, IT um, uh, compute, so operating system. Then we have our different big customer groups, middleware, to provide different um, services to the end customers, which are um, different kind of applications, many thousands of them. So um, there is, of course, additional um, uh, private cloud or container approach. But as you see, uh, you probably know the joke. <laughs> There is no cloud, there is just someone else's computer. So you have to, to, to do IT operations also on those systems. Um, the numbers speak for themselves. They are not uh, applications, they are application clusters. So for example, if I tell web has 10,000, that means 10,000 environments that consist of load balancers, uh, uh, front end Apache servers, back end application servers. Most of them have test integration production environments, so you can just sum up the numbers. So, who are we? Um, that's not our team, that was just a picture I took from the media pool. Um, we actually are a pretty small number of internal people who have different contracts with uh, external IT providers who do the first and second level IT operations, so daily business, extending file systems, uh, handling user tickets, and so on. We have some caretakers, I call them. They are basically internal consultants um, um, in our teams who talk with database team, who talk with uh, a storage team, so basically the, the customer contact. And this is still inside the company, so we are not providing any external uh, services. This is just inside. So customers is basically in-house customer. And there are the, the Linux solution teams. Um, we are a very small number who basically design the whole uh, Linux landscape that's then uh, at the end operated by the, the IT providers we, we task. We have uh, about, I don't know, last time I checked, it was just about 12,000 uh, OS instances. Um, we doubled the number of systems in the past three years, so <laughs> explosion. Um, we have different kinds of hardware vendors, so every couple of years there's a hardware tender and whoever uh, has the best conditions gets the, the job. And uh, we also do uh, a lot of virtualization. So you can approximately see that the virtualization ratio is, is quite high, but that there is of course there are of course uh, uh, workloads that cannot be virtualized. So for example, a six terabyte uh, in-memory database you don't want to put in a virtual machine. 
and this is the, the most important, we are not just providing uh, uh, an operating system as you can get in AWS, so where you spin up your 10 instances and do whatever you want. We provide a serviced Linux OS. So basically, you order an IT system, you get one in about six days, and you can have it up to six years or uh, as long as the, the support of that operating system is serviced. You don't have to take care about patching, everything else, we do that for you. Um, and this also means um, getting a Linux system in our environment, in this classic IT, I call it, means you don't have uh, permanent root privileges. Sorry, Felix. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and based up on these Linux systems, what do we call production? Um, BMW, cars. We produce cars. Um, yeah, <laughs> even if it's quite hard because uh, I, I work in IT and uh, I have to go once or twice a year to the production plant to actually see cars because uh, otherwise you get sucked up in all the, the daily uh, things. So you tend to forget we are actually producing cars. <laughs> a lot of plant control systems, assembly lines, uh, real time delivery systems, they run. Uh, they, you could call them mission critical. Uh, they run on Linux systems, mostly virtualized Linux systems. Um, also quality control systems, um, like for example, there is this, this quite important application that does 3D triangulations inside the plant. There are sensors, just like GPS, but in-house. Um, every car has a transponder and also every tool has a transponder. And if the, the employee on the, the uh, assembly band uh, fixes something or, or just screws something on, it basically triangulates the car and the, the tool and connects the, the, the measured performance data of, of the, the tool being used and saves, saves it in the database. So that's, I don't know, that has uh, 24 cores and is, it's always on at, I don't know, 60-70% of CPU time. So it just has to run, otherwise you don't know uh, how the airbag is actually uh, fixed in the car and then you have to scrap the whole car because it does, it's, does not comply with regulations. And this is where human safety depends on. So um, it's, it's basically metal processing is one way. So there is no, okay, I will just spin up two other containers and then it, uh, the, the user will, will hit F5 on the web application and it will, will come on again. And because all of that very important and also a very numbers, ap numbers applications, it's not easy to do our job. That we have various maintenance windows, mostly twice a year if we are lucky, and rollouts and everything else can take up a whole year. So for example, Meltdown Spectre, um, tried it on a dead system, so uh, you might add, end up breaking all production assembly lines. So. <laughs> Why don't we just use and migrate everything to fancy you new know, scale-out uh, systems, uh, environments? Because business requirements don't touch running system. It works. Or we have purchased applications. Um, they have been uh, put in place by an external consultant who gets more than I earn in the money in about two hours. Um, the, and then it runs for three or four years. So <laughs> many of these applications were not uh, designed to be containerized or run in public cloud or private, even private cloud. And you have to think about everything that you might put into containers right now. You, we have to maintain them for years. So today's new fancy technology is tomorrow's legacy IT. Just like Mark said, I don't know what's currently uh, so uh, uh, hip. It's going to be something different, I can promise you, in uh, four years. How do we manage that? We have a pretty high standard uh, regarding OS and all the environment. We have one OS vendor, SUSE Linux Enterprise, 11 and 12. We have a customized standard image that you get that image and there are just small application specific configurations 
that are basically deviating from this, but otherwise you get the standard. You cannot choose Ubuntu or Debian. Um, we have a standardized communication and approval system. We, all the IT stuff uses the same uh, IT tool. I have to open the same uh, ticket or the same tool uh, if I have a problem with my phone, if the file system on the server is full. And there are also uh, approval steps for changes that require uh, uh, modifications on IT systems. So we could ask, uh, here, you have to patch and they will cancel it because they have some production on, ongoing on that weekend. The other very important thing is we have standardized documentation. We have a very big configuration management database where every of the configuration item IP address, network cable, host name is documented. So we basically install what is documented and not document what is installed. So this is where the, basically where we start. Um, there's also a very big price tag on that because people want some tweaks here and there and it's not easy to get everybody happy and mostly business requirements uh, overrule uh, the, the most basic standards and these are the deviations you have to take care of. And over a long time period, like four to six years, these deviations tend to sum up and create a very colorful landscape if you're not using the proper tools. So, we are looking for a tool. Um, we have some, we had some basic requirements that is basically, that was our wish list. This is, if everything of this is, is possible, we are very happy. Um, of course, you cannot get all of this without, uh, 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 or you cannot get everything uh, out of the, the shelf that fulfills this one. So, we found, we found one. Uh, we choose Rudder because Rudder was the one that fits the best at our requirements and at our landscape. It has a very good, real, almost real-time reporting of the policy. It has a very usable UI. For example, here you see this is a base uh, a policy that creates something, and I will get instantaneous report. This is 90% compliant. This is 5% deviation, and the rest of the 10% are not measured because the agent hasn't run yet or is offline or something like that. But we still had to do a lot of uh, adjustments. Uh, to our existing tools, it had to be integrated somehow in a big environment. We had to do monitoring, sizing, and understand how, how and what it does because you cannot manage systems if you're not familiar with your tool. So this is rather under the, the skin. I don't want to waste too much time. Uh, the, the main thing is it has a central policy engine that generates policy for every node Based on inventory data it receives from the node itself, so you can create dynamic policy like I want the management and monitoring tools for this hardware only on the hardware that actually belongs to. So it's actually something that's very handy. Uh, it also receives reports directly from the nodes and puts it in the compliance DB, so you can query also historical data. When was my system the last time compliant? When did something change? But this is technical stuff. This, we are advancing too fast. Um, we had to do preparations because your tool is only as good as your data is you are building your configuration up on. We had to check all the data that we were planning to put into a tool like this because if the, the data is bad, you can just roll out crap on 12,000 systems and then you better not go to work next day. Um, we had to validate all the data that was already out in the wild because many of the years, without having a proper configuration management, we of course had our own script-based firewalls for GET that was not capable of handling that many uh, uh, that many states. Um, also, we had to start housekeeping. Uh, we had to decommission old policies or scripts that were not longer used or that were outdated. 
We had to check all the configurations in the wild. We created a file collector where you can basically pull, um, I don't know, SSHD config from all the systems. And then it would just basically create a report how many systems are in the state that you supposed to have them, how many deviations are. We actually found a lot of um, uh, standards, additional uh, uh, standards that were actually never documented, just requested on a per system base. Because if you have something that you can describe technically, you can create a rule for it. And we had to design the, the whole infrastructure because we have many locations, we are globally there, we do central IT operations from Munich for all over the world. So it's, it's not easy if you are uh, doing operations in different regions and time zones and network segments and firewalls and this had to be um, uh, designed from the very first point. And risk management. Um, configuration management can solve a lot of problems and it can also create a lot of problems. We had um, to do risk management at the, very, at the very early stage. We had the questionnaire that co uh, consisted of uh, different questions that influence how basically a config change affects your system. How visible is the change? Can you see it first time you log in, uh, like the, the, the prompt color has changed from red to green, or is it something that you only find when you next reboot the system it's in about half a year? Maintenance effort, process, who is going to, uh, who is allowed to change the config? If you do middleware deployment, database uh, uh, settings, who is allowed to request a change because we are not maintaining database uh, configuration they come, that, that comes from the database team. Who is allowed to request a change for what systems? All this stuff, all this stuff had to be evaluated, and this basically created uh, a risk factor of the given policy that also um, defines how fast you can roll out this configuration. Like an SSH config, you will probably not push out in one day, but to create a new user is way less risky than changing something that essential. We know our risks, how can we mitigate them? Um, we created a quite complex staging environment. There, is, there, is, there are multiple stages before actually a new policy or a change of policy hits real production. We have test environments where the developers can play around and then there is a completely separated uh, quality assurance integration testing where we basically test the new policy on a set of sandbox systems but with real applications on them. And the outcome of this risk evaluations uh, shown in the, the slide before that also determines how critical the policy is. We have test cases for everything. You have a policy that installs the compiler. Great, put in a C file, try to compile it. Is it the outcome still that you expect from it? We have also test clients uh, uh, continuously reinstalled so we can know, okay, the whole life cycle of the config management is working from the very first stage until the, the very end. We have also came. We also came up with uh, development rules because uh, we are not the only ones uh, typing in policy. The, the policy creation can actually be outtasked and, and ordered from others. But you probably know. You try to start uh, creating something. The first thing is how do I name it? Um, we created a naming uh, convention that has to be followed. That that also helps you identifying what does the rule do, and you can also search for it. It's quite easy. If you want to find something that changes a file, just look for file and then you will get those 20 that modifies a file. We also uh, wanted not to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to use those techniques available. It's also important that if some small part is missing or not working as you wanted, we always consult with upstream with the developers to discuss if it's possible to change that, to add that, because we don't want to maintain a, a, a completely separated a parallel branch of, of things. 
and if something new comes out, we try to upstream it as much as possible. All our solutions must be tested on SLES 11 and SLES 12. It's also important, so we actually test the whole uh, policy on the whole landscape we actually have. And one important thing, no credentials, because as soon as you have some credentials in it, it can be uh, just somehow, it can get out. Um, because if you don't have credentials in it, you can actually give it to people to audit. Because if there is an audit, they might ask, what does your policy do? And then you can hear, here's my policy. But if you have a user password hash in it, not sure you want to give that to an external audit company. What are we using it for, the whole thing? Currently, we de deploy OS base settings, keyboard layouts, DNS, NTP, depending on uh, the physical location of the server that comes from our CMDB. And that's also uh, defined by different inherited groups. So we actually just have to put in the lo physical location of a server and it gets the correct DNS entries and everything. We also use it to enforce security compliance. We have a BMW bank that uh, you can get financed your shiny new BMW car by, and they have very strict requirements. You know the, the banking oversight; <laughs> they 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 don't mess around. So there there were questions: uh, Can you ensure that your SSHD config was not modified in the past two years? I don't know. Can you? We'd rather. We have an agent running every 15 minutes on a system that actually reports back green, 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 oh, red. Let's have a look what happened then. So, how was actually our progress? Um, we started rolling out the agent and all the SLES 11 systems we had back then a couple of years ago, uh, 8,000. We had just one test rule applied that basically touched the file so we know it's working. If the file is there, rather is there and receives policy. We faced some issues. Um, it's not, it was not uh, performing that well as soon as we added batches of 200 nodes a day. As soon as we hit a couple of thousand nodes, performance was decreasing. I mean, I can't blame them. Probably nobody is going to test their systems or config management systems for 10,000 nodes. I mean, if there's a requirement, you probably would do that, but not if you think 2,000 nodes are many nodes that you want to manage with. We also had the big diversity on our system, so that also caused us to, to slow down on the, the, the rollout of the whole tool set. So we made a decision. We will do a green field. We were just on the edge of uh, introducing SLES 12. Um, for those who don't know, SLES 12 is the, the, the cut where system D comes in, so that changes everything. And it was pretty good because we knew there is not going to be an update passed between SLES 11 and SLES 12. It can only be done with a new installation, so we made green field because all of the application we know had to redeploy their stack regardless what comes. So we disabled the old rollout tool and had all the applications resubmit their requests for SLES 12. Since then, um, there were very good improvements in Rudder. Um, they are actually working on sizing and performance issues on number of nodes that we are currently not at, so this, they, they have an advantage right now. Um, and also a very fine grain dry run mode came in where you can basically put a node in dry run or a policy in dry run or parts of policy in dry run. You can actually test, would it break something if I would switch it on to change something? And also uh, a lot of uh, API and, and uh, other plugins came in that you can actually natively interface with your data sources and pull in data directly by Rudder into Rudder if you tend to have an external data store where that holds your configuration. Currently, we are working on testing and enabling SLES 11 landscape for our policy. It's still not the, the majority that's in Rudder right now, but we plan to 
hits that number of nodes that you have seen the very early slides, hopefully in a couple of years. <laughs> um, we have written a lot of command line tools that interfaces with Rudder. The Rudder has a nice API, but you don't want to click around in the user interface for daily jobs like installing a new uh, a middleware component that's basically a one step and it comes 20 times a week. You don't want to click around in the UI. You want to just fire one script and then it works. So this is where we are actually currently also working on creating an easy to use tool set for administrators not to have their precious time clicking around in the UI that's actually meant for developers doing policy validation and, and uh, writing. So currently our workflow with Rudder is quite good. We start the installation, deploy the whole operating system and Rudder is basically included with all the data without interaction. So this is actually good. The operations team doing daily business has standard changes, standard tasks, install me an Oracle client, install this middleware component. They have a set of, of rules that can be applied without any further acknowledgement. And if you have to do something manually in the, in the UI, then you have the change workflow that the router provides natively, where a second pair of eyes has to confirm the change and also approve the rollout. Yeah. We have made some adjustments or additional tooling to the whole rudder ecosystem that we have built up. Um, the root to relay synchronization, <laughs> it's typical uh, sizing limit. CF Engine didn't reuse TCP sessions and if we hit 3000 nodes, each had uh, about 80 files and then you had to open a TCP session for each file to do the synchronization it, over a van to South Africa that adds some overhead. We replaced the relay synchronization with rsync and it went down from 40 minutes to below one minute. So there. We also have made a root-to-root -root environment synchronization where you basically if you have your staging environment and if you know that works, you can put that whole set of policy to your multiple production environments. There is also an inventory uploader daemon that we have written because if you have 8,000 nodes and they send their inventories because of some uh, splay class magic, all within the same 10 minutes. The whole system just gets overloaded as it's currently. So we have written a daemon that basically uses iNotify to watch for incoming files and then just fills up the queue as, as the processing goes on. And this actually helped a lot with processing the inventories. We also have some uh, future ideas, greater long-term ideas. Um, that we are currently missing at the very base design of Rudder, you, you only can have one version of a policy. If you change your policy and it gets approved, then the policy change is basically applied to all nodes that it belongs to. It would be good if you could version your, your rule and then the, the, the new version would only get rolled out in different stages, 1%, 5%, 25 or you name it, how your, your business is actually accepting the, the change. You could also make it not to roll out to production plans, only to test systems and then each plant uh, on its own, on its own maintenance window. So this is currently what we have also worked around with a custom rollout uh, script that basically does implement this logic and do, does rather magic to, to roll out uh, policy changes in a staged way. Also, multi-tenancy or multi-team is basically a feature we are missing. You cannot say this group of users only has permission to modify that set of objects. For example, that group of servers, that web servers can only be modified by the web team. So that's currently all or nothing if you have the permissions to do that. But otherwise, we are actually very happy with 
all the things that currently we have implemented. So what is the most important thing I want to give you? If you are doing policy design, please make sure that you think about the risks that are involved with every policy change, who is responsible for the kind of policy, if you have a, a different uh, operations team doing all the operations and not the classic DevOps, um, you might consider that. And uh, also we had a lot of uh, issues with uh, identifying the existing deviations. And this is also why we actually choose to go with Rudder because it, the first time it hurts very much if you get reverted to the same state every 15 minutes, but this also helps you to almost instantaneously find any deviations that was made by someone who has pseudo permissions and uh, thinks that he should change the SSHD config because he's missing something. So this is of, from a point of view of a compliancy from uh, all over uh, uh, regulations, this is something that is not allowed. If you do this for fun in AWS, you might go over with it, but think about your compliancy uh, if there is something uh, that you have to follow. Well, thank you very much for your attention.